Well, happy Mother's Day. And uh, I hope it's okay that I, that I don't concentrate on mothers alone today, but we're going to do some talking about you women. Us guys talk about you while you're not here, so we might as well talk about while you are. And uh, we recognize your value. Uh, I recognize the influence that you bring to the rest of us keeping us on track, keeping us uh, on focus, and we appreciate that so very much. This congregation, as along with many that I am aware of, is so dependent on the sacrifices that ladies make to make things work. And right now, we are in a period of time when something kind of comes up and something needs to be done, and I, I hardly have to ask anything anymore. You, you are just there. You know what to do. You know how to do it. And you just go about and do it again. And I thank you so very much. Um, Roy and Kelly, thank you for that pillows and picnic party. <laughs> or whatever it was. And uh, what a good program for our young ladies. I'm going to take what you would probably call a very traditional approach to uh, Mother's Day today, but it's really not at all in my mind. But I want to go to a, um, to a woman in the Bible. We don't know if she was described by her character and her personalness as a personal woman, or if it was a kind of a montage of all kinds of characteristics that a great woman would possess. The text is found in Proverbs 31, and we affectionately call her the Proverbs 31 woman. We have to call her the Proverbs 31 woman because nowhere is her name mentioned. And so we presume that, and no, we don't have to make her a real live woman individual woman, but only uh, at an area that, that I got to see last week. Last week was one of those weeks that I took my text that I was going to share with you this morning, and I read it. And then I read it again. And then I read it again. And then I just read it slowly and thought, Lord, what is this, what is this woman like? What is, what is she saying to us? Or what is the word saying to us about her or through her? Uh, and I just sp spent hours of time meditating on these verses. And what I, what I concluded was, more than a list of characteristics, she was a woman of phenomenal attitude. Attitude governs so much of the decisions we make. Attitudes govern the instinctive or intuitive choices that we process in our lifetime. And, and we either are attracted to or attracted away from people around about us based on their attitudes. I appreciate running around with people of positive attitude. I happen to be a glass half full guy. I need to put a right spin on everything. I need to bring sunshine into those light places. I need to bring a little bit of a rosy quality to every situation. And even no matter how difficult it is, I, could, I can go to a, a hospital call and visit somebody who is just in a terrible condition and have a little impulse that if I make them smile or laugh a little bit, their day's better off. It's an attitude thing. And, and so I don't apologize at all to the fact that uh, I'm an optimist because I think optimists are basically people of faith who have decided that God was saying it right in the first place and that what he says he will do, and what he says it is like, it will be like, and what he says is going to happen will happen exactly like he says it's going to. And, 
And so I want to talk about this attitude thing today. I want to take another direction with it also, just in the developmental area. I remember, I remember several years ago, I was, uh, I was attending a seminar, a seminar on uh, financial management, on budgeting, on retirement programs, on, um, on investments. And, and I remember a comment that the instructor made that's a famous comment, not necessarily unique to him, but a comment that I j just stuck right here. And that is, as he said to us, he says, gentlemen, in all of the investments you make in your life, make sure that the most important investment you make is in your life, not in your future. We tend to look at investments, for instance, 401ks or retirement programs or pension plans, and we, and we project it way out there somewhere in the future. And we think because we have governed and controlled the areas in the future that we don't have, need to do anything else about today. Except, listen, today is a whole lot more important than tomorrow. And I'll even discuss this thing about tomorrow with you in a few moments. It's important to recognize the fact that we... Are we go through life and we literally, we make investments. We invest time and energy and insight into each other's lives. And I watched this Proverbs 31 woman and the investments she made because of her attitude that changed people's lives around about her. So I want to read this text with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, you might want to go to it. If you don't, just listen. It's okay. Uh, chapter 31 of Proverbs, beginning in verse 10. An excellent wife, who can find? That's an interesting beginning. So now we're looking for an excellent wife. By the way, uh, the scripture says that he that finds a wife finds a good thing and finds favor in the sight of the Lord. I remember a lot of years ago, I was contesting with a man who was saying to me that he, was, that he had to divorce his wife. And uh, it was kind of like, well, why? What's going on? She says, well, he used that scripture on me. He says, the Bible says, he that finds a wife finds a good thing, and she is not a good thing. So she must not be a wife. So because she's not a wife, I can treat her any way I want to. And it was quite a con contesting issue. But here again, the establishing setup, we're looking for the perfect wife. What's the perfect wife like? Can you afford one? The, script, the, the same verse says that her worth is greater than jewels. But how about this? About every year or two, somebody comes up with a clever idea of analyzing what it would cost a typical man to hire everything done that his wife does. Do you know what her value is on a yearly basis? $117,000. Whoa. Boy, did I get a deal. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to pay for all the stuff that Jolene does for me. Her value is greater than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her. And he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like a merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. She rises up a while, uh, also while it is still dark and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. For her earnings, she pl from her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff 
and her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the gate. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teachings of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her, her husband also. And he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. So charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. A phenomenal portion of scripture the description of a phenomenal person and it is it is so out of reach for our thoughts to combine all of this into one person that's probably why the scripture never gives her a name presuming that it was not necessarily a literal one single individual but was a quality and an intention and an attitude that is to govern the lives of all of us. She was famous because of the investments she made. I believe if you see this right, you can see that same phrase that I shared with you earlier. Of all the investments you make in your life, make sure that the greatest one you make is into your life, into your family, into those around about you. And you don't take what is to be taken today and pass it off till tomorrow. Just because you are saving it for a rainy day. Though that is absolutely biblically vital. It's important though that we recognize the fact that all of us folks. All of us who know anybody. All of us who are surrounded by anybody. Are literally making investments into their lives. Investments that are increasing and paying dividends of kindness and goodness and relationship and love or investments that are going down the tubes like a falling stock. We are investing. We are investing for somebody's betterness or for someone's worse. We are investing for somebody's big life or smaller life. The challenge continually is to recognize through conduct and behavior and attitude that that, be, that investment is done honestly and really. You see, most of us would struggle keeping an investment that never returned a dividend or an increase. I probably would not be a very successful stock broker because I know what it's like to invest in a stock that fell apart. A long time ago, I had a good stock. I didn't pay much for it, five, six dollars a share. But at one point in time, it kind of turned around and started going down. And I thought, oh, they all go up and they all go down. So I wrote it down. And then I wrote it down. And then I wrote it down. And suddenly what you realize, if you know this, you, some of you know this to be true. Suddenly you realize that you've ridden it down too far to then get rid of it. So what are you going to do? Are you going to sell it and just take this great loss? No, you invested in it for the gain. And so you chicken out taking the loss and then you write it down a little farther 
I literally wrote a stock down to the company's bankruptcy. And uh, boy, do I know how to invest. Okay, My theory is to buy high and sell low. And, uh, and, and yet, listen, we are investing all the time. And, and however those relationships work is dependent upon whether there's something growing out of it or growing from it. And, of course, all of them have hard, hard times. You know the, the market. The market is up and the market is down. It's soft and it's doing well and, and all, is, all is okay. But I, I want to talk to you this morning real quickly just to, briefly about the investments this woman made and the results of those investments. If you read the story, the first investment she made was in her husband. Good piece of wisdom, ladies. I say this probably to my discredit. Julie and I have always talked about one of her primary callings in life is to make me look good. And... Uh, and if there's ever a moment, matter of fact, somebody came up to me after the first service and says, Jolene's doing good. She dresses you well. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and every once in a while, I'll come out of the bedroom ready to, ready to come to the church, and she'll look at me and she'll say, are, are you really going to wear that? <laughs> you know what that's all about, don't you, men? Sure you do. The greatest investment you'll ever make is in your husband. Now, wh what does that mean? Well, let's look at some of those scriptures together, shall we? In verse uh, 10, it says, An excellent wife, who can find it? For her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. If the, if the attitude is right, if the, if the investment is good, he will be taken care of and processed very well. And then way down into about verse, uh, what is it, 23 of that same chapter, it goes on to say, her husband is known in the gates when she sits among the elders of the land. Now this woman was married to a somehow successful man. And we know that behind every successful man is a successful counseling woman. And I could use all the other phrases that we've used at that point other than to say that, hey, we recognize the fact that if we want to be great, a uh, matter of fact, I heard a phrase once. It says uh, to, the, to the husbands, husbands, if you want to be the king of your castle, you've got to remember you live with a queen. When we do that well, it always comes back to us. Wives, when you invest well, not only are you taken care of, but your husband looks good. I, can't, I, I, I relate to this guy, this, this guy here in verse 23. It says he, he sits at the gate with the elders of the of this community. Well, what are they doing at the gate, at the community? It, culturally, in those days, there would have been typically a little place by the city gate where the elders meet and talk. They talk about civic issues. They talk about some family problems. They talk about some economic issues in the community that they need to address. And they probably look for a little, a few roads that need to be repaved, et cetera, et cetera. They talk about it. But the important thing is this. When this woman's husband sits there, he's admired by the others. That's really important to men. It's important to men to be admired by their peers. This guy was admired. I don't know what the conversation would have looked like, but if I were just kind of a little overlooking them, I would kind of, in my mind, I'd hear somebody saying, oh, George, i tell you something. You're a lucky guy. Matter of fact, George, I, I, I wish I went home every night to the household you go home to without saying, I wish I had a wife like yours. Uh, that might not have been quite appropriate, but suddenly the guy looks good because he's respected by his peers. He's respected by his peers because his wife makes him look good. 
I think that's a challenge thing to all of us, no matter where we are. And so as we look at this woman making her investments into life, into her life, we find out that it's important that she made her investments into her husband. Now, boy, I could spend a lot of time with that whole issue about husbands and wives in the New Testament. This is strictly a way of Old Testament thing. Uh, but remember this. Maybe you don't know this. Do you know something, wives? Do you know that the Bible never tells you to love your husband? Did you know that? The only, thing, the only reference to wives loving their husband is that older wives should teach their younger women how to love their husbands. But it never says to the wife, wife, love your husband. It says, wife, respect your husband. Wife, honor your husband. Wife, elevate your husband to a place of honor among his peers. Wives, make your husband look good. Now, that works well if we, the husbands, read the other part of the letter that says, husbands, you love your wives. You love your wives and they'll make you look good. You love your wives, they'll treat you right. You love your wives, the investment will bring forth good returns. And so if the process works, and for a long time we are aware of the fact that though we, rec that we think that this whole good marriage thing is a 50-50 deal, and I'm saying no, it's not a 50-50 deal, it's a 100-100 deal. And if one of them does zero to make it work, the other can make up the difference and make it work because of commitment. And so here she makes her, hu her husband look good all the days of his life. Now, second investment she makes is in her family. Listen to these verses. Verse 15. She rises also while it is still dark and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. And verse 21. She, uh, she's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with garments she makes coverings for herself and cl and clothing and fine linen and purple in verse 27 she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness her children rise up and bless her her husband also and he praises her saying many daughters have done nobly but you excel them all Investing in her household. Her household includes her husband, her children, her handmaids, her servants, people that work for her. It says she took care of them. She watched out for them. She treated them right. She treated them with care. Thirdly, and I'm going to hurry along this morning just for the sake of time. She made a great investment in herself. I think there are some times that this gets lost. I, I think our desire to spiritually understand a selflessness attitude toward the Lord and a sacrificial lifestyle for ourselves I think that clears the way to be misunderstood that you don't have to take care of yourself. And yet that's not what it says. Matter of fact, it says just opposite to that. It says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, I'm not sure that that as, what that as means. That as easily leads down to in proportion to, in the same dimension you love yourself love your neighbor or it might mean as you to, as you go toward the loving of yourself you also love yourself along the way with it I'm not sure what it means it doesn't matter it does mean this that if you don't love yourself you won't love your neighbor as you should if you don't take care of yourself you will not take care of those around about you if you don't compliment lift up or build up those are uh, yourself first you will not do it to anybody around you and so it's important to recognize the fact that here was a woman. Listen to how she took care of herself. 
In verse 17, and I, I, I kind of chuckled inside myself with this. It says, she girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. And, and I, 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 saw, I saw a gym. I saw a, a, a gal tripping off to the gym, lifting weights and pushing pedals and, and, and swimming laps. I saw a girl who took care of herself physically. She made her arms strong. She, um, uh, she girded herself with strength. I don't know if that's all it meant. But then it goes on to say in, in verse 25, it says, strength and dignity are her clothing. Strong women are of vital value to all of us and to her husband. And so she took care of her, first of all, she took care of her health. Ladies, that means taking care of your body. Eating right, eating appropriately. Secondly, she took care of her reputation. She was absolutely pretty well thought of, but why? She was well thought of because she did things right. She was well thought of because she was a servant heart, even though she was strong, independently wealthy, yet she had a strong attitude toward those around about her. In verse 26, it says, she opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of, of kindness is in her lips, her reputation. What do people think of her when they see her? Oh, she's kind. Oh, she's gentle. Oh, she never talks bad about anybody. Oh, she's so wise. She's so encouraging. It says the right words are on her tongue. That will always give her a right reputation. And then in verse 19, it says, uh, she, let's see, where is it? Um, she stretches out her hand to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. You, you know what that's about? It's a, it's a spinning wheel. It's a, it's a weaver thing for converting uh, the, the wool or, or, or whatever it is into into cloth or I mean into uh, yarn so you can make clothes out of it. But I saw something in this is very interesting. The, 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 the weavers and the, and the spindlers of yarn was not the highest paid job in the community. It was not the greatest reputation in community. But here was a woman who could have done only the big things. She could have bought and sold the Panama Canal. She could have sold a lot of stuff and in good favor. Instead, she never lost touch with the working person. She never lost touch with the hurting person. She never lost touch with the underpaid person. She never lost touch with the lower class, economic classes in her community. And she always maintained her skill about doing the, 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 the common stuff, the, the spinning wheel stuff, and, and, and along that same line. She was a woman who took care of herself and her reputation and her activities in a commonly other way. And then, then she made great investment in the lives of other people. She extends her hand to the poor. She stretches out her hands to the needy. She was a somebody, but never lost track of the nobodies, never lost track of the hungry, never lost track of the, of the homeless, never lost track of the people that you see every day on the streets, homeless or street people. And they are oftentimes overlooked by all of us. And yet a compassionate heart never overlooks them. I drive through town with somebody who still rolls the window down, gives them a dollar.
it's not my problem as a giver to the needy what he's going to do with it. We oftentimes don't do anything with them because we know what they're going to do with most of it. They're going to fuel a habit. But because we don't approve of the habit, we then don't approve of them. You need to, be, you need to remember that they are somebodies. Though lost in this world at the moment, but not always. We need to care for the hungry and for the poor. And we need to make investments in other people beyond ourselves and beyond our families. Are we doing okay with all of that? And then, and then she needs to make a great investment in the prosperity and the financial wealth of that family. That doesn't mean she needs a job. It doesn't mean that she should match her husband's income. It doesn't mean any of that, though it could mean all of that. But listen to these verses. In verse 16 it says, she considers a field and she buys it. Then presumably she does something else with it. She buys it and sells it or sells something else. But then it says, with her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She buys this, she sells this, she plants a vineyard, she builds a, pro, a, a picture of prosperity that the whole family gets to enjoy together. I think one of the greatest things that we need to understand is that, that it's, the e, it's ease with which we uh, misunderstand even the scriptural teachings. In our culture, I think we struggle a little bit culturally with the idea that men should step up and do the finances of the, of the family. Noble, noble idea. Until you realize that the wife is twice as good at doing that as the husband is. Then you've got something to talk about. You're not talking about one or the other. You're talking about both. I'm good with sitting down with my wife and discussing with her where we are financially, what our plans are, what our investments are, what it's going to lead us to, what are we going to do with it when we're all over all of this. All of that's important because you know what? One of these days I'm going to die and she needs to know where the money is and why we put it there. I think Missy knows too. <laughs> I think Missy will probably have to tell her mother where it's at. The important thing is this, that as a unit of, of relationship, together we build a great institution called family, called marriage. And this woman adds such depth and such strength to it's all possible. And suddenly when you realize that so many of us get to enjoy the benefits of somebody else's fruit. And then um, it goes on to say that, uh, that, where is it up here? She, um, here, she makes linen garments and sells them. And supplies belts to the tradesmen. She buys and sells. Okay. Now, again, I'm not suggesting this is a formula that any of us need to embrace. I think we're talking attitudinal here. Even though this could be a great idea for some of you, it might not be the new formula of success that we talk about. But, but what we really are talking about is, is an attitude, and I, 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 saw this, I saw this girl's attitude. I like her attitude. And, and, and you know what it is? Matter of fact, let me read this to you, and I, I chuckled when I read this. Listen to it. Strength and dignity 
are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. To me, there's a little sense of humor here. She smiles at the future. Doesn't she know what the future holds? Of course she doesn't. And of course she does. She knows that tomorrow could be a lot worse than today. She knows that today could make tomorrow really look good. She knows that hardship's going to come. But she's not afraid of it. She's not afraid of it because she knows her God. She knows that what holds tomorrow is security for her. And so she looks at the future and smiles. I can see this girl kind of saying, hey, come on, world. Give me your best shot. I'm ready for you. Being totally confident that she's ready for tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't even really know how to get ready for it. Except spiritually, we know this. We know that our relationship to God prepares us for whatever tomorrow is. And we don't have to be afraid of tomorrow. And you need to recognize the fact that sometimes people are around about us who we need to remind, listen, God is in control and we're all okay. Okay? No problem with any of that. And so... With, with, all, with all of that, I just, I just want to bring you back to just this place of uh, this wonderful Proverbs 31 woman. It is, is actually a, a, a literal challenge to women at, a, at an attitudinal level or spiritual level especially. But you know what? I, I learned something from this. I learned something by reading other people's mail. And I'm okay with that. Are you all right with all of that? <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's been a good day. I believe attitude is so important. It determines our investments. Our investments return to us joy or sorrow based on our attitudes. Amen. Amen? Will you stand with me? I want to pray with you. I want to turn you loose. <sighs> and, uh, oh, you know, just a word about next Sunday. If you really want to be alone for a Sunday, come on over to church here. If you want to be where the rest of us are, we'll be down at the park. But uh, you saw the video, and you, you, you saw me on several, several versions of that. But you also saw that that was the one time of the year that I got to wear my shorts to church. What time? 10.30. 10.30. <laughs> Not only, now, I like Carl's shirt. I saw the shirt that I wore. I'm going to wear the same shirt this year that I wore last year, and Carl gave it to me. Uh, and, and it says something like, Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> uh, I think I want to challenge you guys, if you're going to wear t-shirts, wear, wear a message t-shirt. Should we do that? It's just kind of a fun thing to do for the day. And then remember that that day is also dog friendly. No, no, I can't bring my dog. But well, now, I'm just going to remind you that it's only dog friendly for friendly dogs. <laughs> yeah, that's not friendly in my house. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, just be just be where you need to be. Uh, yeah, I don't want your dog eating off my plate. Let's pray, and I'll turn you loose. Lord, you've been good to us. You've given us so many good examples of what we should be like and the attitude of faith that we should share 
in our lives with those around about us. I ask the Lord that we would just have a good day today honoring our mothers, blessing them in every way we can, honoring them above all the others. And so bless us as we go from our way from this place today, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Bless you as you go. Have a wonderful day with your families.